Great Wednesday, and welcome to the Fully Human Connections Podcast. I'm your host, King, and I'm joined by my co-host, Reggie. How are you doing today, Reggie? I'm doing well, King. Always glad to be here on Wednesday morning in conversation with you. So I'm, I'm good to go. Same here. Same here. And, you know, as we like to get things started with a gratitude moment, I'll begin by saying I'm grateful for my life, my health, my ability to see, hear, talk, have sound mind, walk, breathe, as well as have a roof over my head, food to eat, a mother who's alive, who has sound mind, the infinite possibilities that they may bring, problems and challenges, challenges, I should say, in my life that I have, as well as just the things I'm going to learn and this opportunity to have this great discussion with you. So those are things I'm grateful for today. How about yourself? Yeah, thank you for that. So, um, yeah, I'm grateful to have indoor plumbing, uh, electricity, especially that allows me to keep food um, fresh, especially in the warmer weather. Um, I'm grateful for living in a relatively temperate climate most of my life in the northeastern U.S., most of the time in New York and Connecticut, where we do get storms and blizzards and ice storms on occasion, but compared to much of the planet, we've been pretty fortunate um, most of my life. And, you know, just to steal from you, just to, you know, as far as I can tell, a relatively sound mind, <laughs> um, a, a healthy body. <clears throat> and um, something I'm really aware of today is, is um, the ability to have second chances. So um, in other words, when I try something, whether it's professional or personal, and it doesn't work out um, as I hoped it might, I can try again and, and again and again and again. So um, multiple chances very often. So I'm grateful for all of that. And, um, you know, just that we get to do this. Um, we get to sit down on a Wednesday morning, a few hundred miles away from each other um, and be in conversation through a technology that is both a blessing and a curse um, in these modern, you know, contemporary times. Absolutely, absolutely. And so what's your spiritual energy level? From like- yeah, I'm saying I'm showing up because uh, this is, I'm, I'm choosing 10. Um, as I said, I have a, a really good teacher who says it's not so much how you feel in a given moment, but it's what you, how you choose to show up. So even if I were feeling three, if I'm in conversation with you, I'm choosing 10. No, and I say that, I'm laughing as I say it, but I really mean that. So I'm not in any way minimizing the importance of that choice. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, I join you at the 10 as well. Again, like I said, as the engineer in me, I see no value in choosing any number less than 10, you know, then zero being life sucks and 10 being life is awesome. It helps you to be a true North and stay focused on life is awesome and what it means to be awesome throughout the entire day. So tell folks, I never have a bad day. I may have bad moments in my day, but I refuse to have a bad day because I'm always going to do something in that day to shift that energy from just being a bad day to bring me some form of fulfillment or joy. And that's usually by having someone else experience it. Yeah. And I, I would just say to add to that, I have a personal experience of your living what you just said. I forget how many months ago when you had an injury to your hand um, that was pretty significant and um, right when it happened and how you showed up in the weeks that followed that uh, was, you know, a a choice where you could have just kind of bailed out for a while and not done anything. So I was very aware of that being a manifestation of what you choose. So I just wanted to say that. Well, I appreciate that. Appreciate yeah. that. Well, well, us both being 10 today and it's, you know, being a great day. I know we have another exciting topic. So what do you have planned for us? Why don't you walk us into it? Yeah. So as as always, um, those of those folks who know what we're up to here, we're speaking about um, my book which came out in uh, late September of 2022. It's not quite a year old. Um, Healing America's Narratives feminine, the masculine, and our collective national shadow, becoming more fully 
human. And so um, in the book, we identify shadow as that part of a person, uh, an organization, or even a nation that um, is hidden, not recognized, not known, and even disowned or repressed and often projected onto others. And we basically say that the heart of the national shadow of the United States is a manifestation of unhealthy masculine energy. <clears throat> More to the point, there are nine elements of shadow. And in the last um, four weeks, we've looked at ignorance, arrogance, fear, and bigotry in some detail, one episode for each of those. And today we're going to look at violence, um, which is a, a large part of the American story. Um, and so I'm just going to, I rarely do this, but I think as a way to introduce violence, I'm going to read a brief excerpt from the book um, for, the, for those folks who might be following along at home. It's on, begins at the bottom of page 325. Uh, I always like saying that. But um, it, it kind of speaks to the underlying foundational violence throughout American history. And again, it's not a fun thing to acknowledge, but it's a true thing to acknowledge. <clears throat> so, quote, as a nation, America remains an experiment. We were conceived through the fertilization of ideas that gave voice to some and subjugated others. We were born through a bloodbath that pitted Brit against Brit on land stolen from indigenous peoples and developed by kidnapped Africans. We were raised on enslavement, land and property theft, massacre, betrayal, and peasant labor. We were reborn in an attempt to maintain the experiment through an anything but civil bloodbath with ourselves from which we have yet to fully recover. And we were reborn yet again as a, as a financial and military superpower as a result of a global bloodbath. We regularly perpetrate and perpetuate violence against others while refusing to acknowledge and address in any effective way the everyday violence we commit against ourselves. Not yet 250 years old, we're lost in a national adolescence, thinking we're invincible and immortal, despite clear evidence that we are neither. Not only have we not recovered from our bloodbaths of birth and rebirth in any whole integrated sense, we continue to choose to bathe ourselves and others in blood, literally and metaphorically, because that is the normal we know. And when I say normal we know, that's the end, end of the quote, you know, 103 people, give or take, die every day from gunshot wounds in this country. About two thirds of those are suicides. There are many other people who die every day from means other than gunshot wounds. So by nature, let me just, let me take that, let me cancel that statement. Um, inherently, by some combination of history, nurture, and belief, not so much by nature, I don't believe, um, violence is in the everyday fabric of American history and current events. So I'll, I'll pause there. Um, and, and that's why it's important that we recognize it, speak about it, because we tend to point to other places that are, you know, right now, Russia and Vladimir Putin are violent. In 2001, Al-Qaeda was violent. Um, in the late 50s and early 60s, because of, of our fear of the violence of communism, we invaded Vietnam. Um, so there's just so many examples of this finger pointing, they're violent, we're not. And that's the real problem with um, any kind of shadow, but especially a collective national shadow. Um, you're muted, King. Well, definitely a great topic. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yep. Yeah, I don't know how I got muted, but there. thank you for that. Definitely a great topic, definitely timely considering uh, where we are in today. And as you say, America is, to me, American is, violence is a part of America as much as apple pie is. You look at that as far as being the twine, not just being negative about America, but just speaking as a fact. 
you know, now me personally, I tend to follow the ideology of that Martin Luther King Jr. when he said there is no life to be found in violence. Every act of violence brings us closer to death. And one thing I want to share as well is another quote says, through violence, you may murder the hater, but you never murder the hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate. You know, and when you begin to, and I always put everything in this perspective for me, when you begin to put yourself on the journey of becoming more fully human, I believe that, especially as we talk more and we really begin to discuss the nine shadow elements that you put out in your book and you talk about the healing process that we need to go through with regards to America's narratives, how deeply imperative it is to really begin to see how you have to change mentally, spiritually, physically, emotionally, as far as becoming more fully human. It's not just making a statement, I'm going to become more fully human. It's a complete transformation that you have to go through. And again, it's not that you actually ever become more fully human. At least I don't believe so in your life, but it's a journey that you go through and stay on, on that course. And hear me. You begin to accept that there are certain things that become more important than the ego, than that shadow that you, that Carl Young talks about, such as having a higher purpose, such as serving, such as living with love. And, and as you begin to think more in those spaces, the less you begin to think about being violent or the thoughts about violence enter your mind. Um, I can, interesting enough, I can watch violent TV shows and I'm kind of uh, like you might be frozen there, Reggie. Oh, there you go. So I can watch violent movies and TV shows and still not harbor violence in my mind and my heart because I believe that the love is greater as an energy source, as a feeling, as a as a goal. Being connected to the energy energy source of love overwhelms the violence. Now I'm not saying I won't be violent if push comes to shove. I'm just saying that my thoughts not violent. I'm not thinking violent thoughts on any given day, and that to me brings me fulfillment. And and looking at the violence that I see on a daily basis. Like I can't even watch the news. The news itself is wild as far as not only the violence they show from murder, from beatings, from uh, you know attacks and things of that nature, assaults, but just the way they deliver it to you, the tonality, the energy they bring through their conversations, that's all violence. You, you watch politicians, they're violent in the context of mm -hmm. how they're constantly attacking one another and calling the other liars and and you know non-american and things of that nature so violence to me is all around us every single day in many forms and unless you have some concrete attachment or alignment with your principles and your purpose to love and become more fully human i really don't know how you can really escape it just from a mental context i should say yeah, no, I, I appreciate you, how you present that. And just so I, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I know that my video froze while you were talking. Both of our videos kind of disappeared and came back. So I'm not sure. And right now we're good, but I'm not. I'm just looking at two little circles, so I'm not sure. Uh, maybe there's something going on between, you know, the, uh, Maryland and Connecticut. <laughs> that's that's a, somebody's trying to interfere with our podcast here. But so I. I you know, th this is, I think, a really, I think all of the topics we speak about are pretty big, but this, the ease with which we perpetrate, and I'm going to say we as Americans, not that, you know, every individual does this, because every individual doesn't do this, um, but the ease with which we perpetrate and perpetuate violence and point to others as being to blame for it. Um, in, in one regard, stems from a, uh, a mistaken identity. So one of the questions that I introduced in the last part of the last two chapters of the book is, 
Um, there are six questions and statements that are really important. And the first one, and I don't think it's the most important one. It could be, but it's who am I really? Um, and, you know, we could spend, you and I could have conversations every week for the rest of our lives about just that question, about how people answer that and what it might mean from a physical perspective, from a social perspective, from a soul-based perspective, from a spiritual perspective. Lots of ways to answer that question. But it seems as though that many of us answer that question from the perspective of the physical and social realms, physical, social, and psychological realms, where I'm this physical body, I have emotions, I, I see things a certain way, and I play a certain role in society. And I've been acculturated, depending on if I'm considered to be male or female, or nowadays if I'm you know, fluid in terms of my gender identity or I don't have a gender identity, but there are certain things I believe to be true about myself. And I believe that my opinion is that as long as we're living in an identity that's purely, okay, you know, body mind, we could call it, you know, where I'm, I'm, I am my body and my mind. So my emotions, my thoughts, my skeletal, you know, uh, my skeleton and my, my muscles and all my organs, as long as we live in that identity, um, we can be trespassed on and we can, we can think someone else is wrong and we can think we have to control other people. Um, and violence, when all else fails, is a way to do that. You know, physical contact. I can stop someone or I can get stopped myself. And at 135 pounds, <laughs> I'm probably going to get stopped. But, <clears throat> but if we answer that question from a soul perspective, you know, what is my archetype or my uh, unique ecological niche, my place in the world beyond my Ooh. physiology and my thought process? Or from a spiritual perspective, if I, I'm, you know, if there's a God who created all things, then I'm a creation of God. Or, you know, in another, in another language, if there's a spirit, um, I'm a manifestation of spirit. Ooh. If that's my identity it's less likely, not impossible, but less likely that I'm, I'm going to choose violence as a response to anything. So I don't think it's important for us to go down the identity rabbit hole in today's podcast, but I think that's an important piece because if I think that I need to defend this piece of land, this belief system, and this musculoskeletal um, vehicle and those of my family and friends, then violence makes a lot more sense because I have to stop the bad guys. Um, but if my identity is other than that, violence makes increasingly less sense. So that's, um, you know, we have these territorial identities and we think violence is a good way to defend them and even extend them onto others. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and within that framework, you know, it's often interesting how people will, media mainly, and then they, they lift up different so-called thought leaders to bring in a certain agenda. And I can say that agenda to me is violent. Like, for example, I don't know if you're familiar with right now in the news, they're talking about um, country music artists, um, the yeah. Jason Aldean. Yep. Came out with the song, or it came out in May actually, but now they're talking about it now for some reason why it's relevant. Uh, try this in a small town. He talks against violence. Now, I've listened to the song, I watched the video. I am not offended by it at all. Actually, you know, I understand what he's saying, and I actually respect his right to have that opinion of what he's saying. To say that, you know, don't bring that violence, don't try this and and a small town because this is what's going to happen to you but what bothers me is how they want to counsel him for saying that he's promoting violence or he's promoting it's an it's a lynching song 
that he's advocating lynching and see how people can read that from that song. Now, again, I'm sure there's some people out there who may actually look at that and, and want to use that song for that purpose. But because of the fact that they brought attention to it, again, the song came out of May and now it's beginning being discussed, it's going to become a lynching song, especially because now they're trying to counsel. They're going to create, because you know, and history has shown us this, when you come out publicly and try to counsel songs like i remember coming up as a young as a young guy listening to rap music and the more they talked about not listening to it the more they canceled certain artists the more everybody listened to them even more it became anthems and so what's interesting to me is how the media and they constantly keep utilizing and weaponizing this racism and and labeling people racist and without really any true repercussions for that because that's a heavy label to lay on someone and the way i was raised and what i saw on tv racist people who are truly racist they tend to take that with a certain amount of pride they don't deny it they accept it and they and they and they lean into that they don't deny it you know so i mentioned all that to say because again the song was violent I mean, the the song was anti-violence. It's a person saying, I'm fed up with what I see on the news. I'm fed up with all this disorder. Regardless of whether him and I agree politically of why the video images he's showing had folks out in the streets. See, that to me is not the issue. The issue is he has the right to say that and feel that way. And as a person growing up in a large city as Baltimore and seeing the violence, the, unlaw the lawlessness in the streets, I kind of wish someone else would come up and have that kind of mentality to say, we need to stop this. This needs to stop. You know, we cannot continue to have unsafe streets because of the violence. It's, I mean, every day, it's uh, an article came out of Washington Post that said that since 2023 is the most violent year in Baltimore for youth. That it's to the point where two youth are dying per week. That's how alarming it's got and it's all violent deaths they're not dying from car accidents or you know heat strokes or things of that nature they're dying from violence and the city has no answers other than the cops to keep saying get you know create better gun laws it's like how can you create a better gun law that's going to stop the violence today what about the guns that are already in the streets what about the mentalities that people already have so that's what i'm getting it we they're not dealing with the real issue, which is America is a violent society in, in its core. But then again, the same token is that the media and the division helps begin to continue to perpetuate more violence. And so that's the part that I find to be, uh, as Malcolm X said, that we're being hoodwinked, bamboozled, led astray and run amok is because they're telling us one thing like you coming from New York, you knew about this uh, three car Molly, but you sit here and you, you know, move the car a certain way, but you use a sleight of hand. And that's what the media is doing. And to me, that's what that's what I keep doubling down on. That to me is helping to perpetuate the violence and keep the violence as normalized as current in our society as, you know, just walking outside and dealing with the with the, um, the, the change in the weather. Fact, it may rain and you just have to accept it and deal with it it doesn't ruin your day yeah it's going to be a violent day it's going to be a violent week and you just have to normalize it and just move on that to me has to change yeah yeah so so thanks for that a couple you know i want to respond to the the aldine song and, and video because i've been reading about that as well and one thing just you know the irony of it is prior to the beginning of the protests against the song and i think the country music association taking the video down from their website prior to that the song I, i'm not going to get i was looking for the the report i read this morning and i'm not going to get the numbers right but let's say it was it had about 10,000 hits or something like that after the after it was <laughs> it was taken down <laughs> and the protest began against it Within like 24 hours, it went up over 200,000. <laughs> so it's great for business. I mean, it's great for him. Um, 
ironically, <clears throat> the the you know, the thing, and I agree with you. You know, he wrote a song, he, he chose the video. That's his right as an artist to to do that. Um, and this is where I think developmental worldview comes, <clears throat> because I'm going to push back a little bit. He, from the, where I sit, if he was truly endorsing nonviolence the song wouldn't have said, try that here. Because what he's basically saying is we're going to be violent back. You're right. not going to get away with that. That's what he was saying. And to in my recollection, um, virtually all of the videos that he showed were of Black Lives Matters protests. He didn't use any video from something like January 6th, where you know a bunch of folks went and attacked the Capitol. So... In, in my looking at the video, I think either he was careless, which I doubt, but he had a specific view he was trying to perpetuate. So Ben, but I agree with you that that's his, that's his view. Um, but I, I don't see it as a, um, as a non-violent or an anti-violent anthem because he's basically saying, try that here and you'll get a taste of our violence. And that's not the, that's not the Kingian move. That's not the Gandhian move. You know, that's not the move. So it's um it's an interesting scenario. But I agree with you that an attempt to cancel um, because we don't like something, as opposed to engage in conversation about it and hear multiple perspectives on it, which is what I'm trying to add to our conversation. As as we you know because. You know, I, I um, agree with your perspective that he has every right to put that out there, um, but I don't. I don't see it as an anti-violence move. I see it as an anti-violence that he doesn't like move, and he would then say, you know, try that here and see what happens. You know, he's not suggesting that people are going to come out in a small town and sing kumbaya. <laughs> I don't right. think so. <clears throat> right. Well. Forgive me if I made if I misspoken and, and made it made it seem like my analysis of it was that it was an anti-violence song. What I was getting at was the fact that he's talking about violence. He's showing violence, and as you're saying that he's talking about violence is going to be met with violence. My issue is the fact that he's being counseled for it. Now I agree that politically and ideologically we may differ. You know. For him showing a Black Lives Matter, and of course, me understanding, you know, the fact that what created that violence that they showed on TV was from other things that he might not necessarily understand, and that small towns not really necessarily dealing with, you know. So, but see, I've gotten to the point where, again, as you become fully human, you're able to listen to both sides yep. and not just say. I know he's wrong for that because they were justified. They wasn't justified to be out there in the streets doing that. Even though we can talk about who really started the riots, you know, and, and a lot of those protesters were, you know, peaceful and those things of that nature. But at the end of the day, it's like we got to take account for the images that be created. You know, not to go too much down this rabbit hole. But I just want to make this point. One of the things doing, and you talk about this in your book during the civil rights movement. The protests there that were very that made them much more meaningful was because they were nonviolent and they were strategically and coordinated tactically to be nonviolent. That you can't even come if you're going to bring violence. So, whereas now it's about well, we're going to show up, you know, we're going to communicate through Twitter and then we're going to just get out in the streets. And you got all these folks out there without being really coordinated, but just have the alignment of we're tired of something, we're frustrated, we want to get our voice out. It's very easy for someone to come in and infiltrate that and start pro, uh, start some violent looting and things of that nature. And now that's what the news is going to capture. They're going to catch that part of it, and that's gets and that's what gets you know gets what um, that's what gets displayed on TV constantly over and over again. And we can get into the, the, you know the, the minutiae of those type of things, but my point at the end of the day is they didn't really help the cause. It, 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 it really divided it more. So now I constantly hear people on the right 
who I watch to hear just their perspective. Not necessarily I agree with their perspective, no more than I say I necessarily agree with our left perspective. I just listen to learn from both sides. Hmm. It's how the right constantly, when they're defending January 6th, they constantly bring up that the, the Black Lives Matter protests and how much violence and how much destruction and property damage that caused and how January 6th it caused nearly nowhere near that kind of that total violence. I mean, total uh, destruction where, you know, you're looking at it from a context, well, you all attack the Capitol. That should be anything remotely even comparable. I say all that to say is that when you allow yourself, again, going back to the system, see the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. those leaders, those organizers understood how the system had to be manipulated to achieve the effect they want. And I'm just going with the new generation doesn't understand that they allow the system to control their actions and the system is saying, well, you respond in this manner and this is going to be the uh, consequences of your actions. And you're not going to achieve the goals you're looking for, which is to get more people in line. You're going to create more divisiveness, more hate. And that's what we're seeing as a result of that. You see that, Reggie? I think Reggie, uh, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but Reggie seems to have a frozen screen. We're having our technical issues here today. I guess the internet doesn't want us talking about violence in this way. So we, we're starting to have some issues. So I want to continue to keep talking until Reggie, uh, Reggie's dropped off. So bear with us right now while we work through these technical issues. And I'm sure Reggie's going to be getting back on here shortly. And I'll let him back in. But I'll continue just to go down the discussion of where we're talking about, again, Reggie's book here of healing America's narratives, the feminine, the masculine, our collective national shadow, become more fully human. Today's topic within that context is on violence. And violence is one of the nine elements of the shadow, of the American shadow that Richard talks about in his book. And what's really interesting is how violence is used in all forms. There's physical violence, obviously when someone comes and either assaults you or there's murders, but there's also mental violence. And that mental violence comes, as I said before, from the media. The media putting out those ideals into your mind to control, to manipulate you, to get you to vote or to get you to take action in a certain way or get you to not take action based off whatever their agenda may be. That to me is violence as well. And that's the part that we got to begin to heal within ourselves. Okay, Reggie's back. Let me let Reggie back into the stream. Welcome back, Reggie. I was continuing the conversation while you were gone. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can. I don't know what happened. All, all of a sudden, I just saw two little screens with circles, and your voice disappeared, and then I was gone. So, um, uh, but welcome but, back. I'm glad to have you back. Yeah, it's good to be back. In fact, and you, you know, you were speaking about the preparation. Um, of the activists in the 50s and 60s for the, during the civil rights movement as, as opposed to the lack of preparation and organization in the uh, you know, more recent protests, especially those following George Floyd's murder. So you know, I heard that much and then they tried to stop us, King. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I just could just add this point and sum it up by saying that it's like I was just watching last night on, on TV the um, revolutionary life of Rosa Parks. Mm. That's what the bus boycott movement was and other protests that she led or was involved with how successful because they were not violent. And I'm just saying that the bus boycott lasts 368 days because there was no violence, at least not from the protesters, right? But because they were strategic, they were intentional, and they knew that in order to get our message felt and to get people to understand where we're coming from, we can't be looked at upon as hoodlums and thugs because it's already a negative image of who we are anyway. We got to show a different image so, so folks can tap into our humanity. And that's where, to me, the BLM got it wrong. They allow themselves to be infiltrated. And from that, those folks who infiltrate them with the agenda to, to disrupt them and to take them off their... I think Reggie may be gone again. So I think we're not going to be able to get through this violent. 
this, uh, today's show talk about violence. For some reason, this is the first time in uh, over 360 shows where we've had this kind of technical issue that we weren't able to get resolved. So we're going to give Reggie some time to get back in. But that's where we got to really begin to ask ourselves, ladies and gentlemen, until Reggie gets back with his analysis is, where do you stand? That's the question I want to let, I want to ask the folks who are listening. Where do you stand? What do you think about the violence here in the country? And how do you think we should resolve that? I think if everybody began to really take ownership and accountability for themselves and to put themselves on a track to become more fully human, then the less you will think about violence personally. Now, you want to escape violence because, because we live in a country that is violent within itself. And violence can be at your door on any given day and any given moment. However, most of us can go through life. I'm 54, going to be 55 this year, I believe. And I've been in maybe four or five fights in my entire life. So there's only been a few times in my life, definitely less than 10, where I've had the need to be violent. And it's not that I run from violence, but I also don't create the energy and put myself in situations that's going to bring violence to me. Not to say that it's all you have to do, because again, violence can come to you. Someone can attempt to carjack me. Someone can break in my home and get put up by the police and that the energy is wrong, that can become violent. However, when you become a more fully human, when you're on that journey, you still focus on what you can do to bring out the best in you. And that's where I'm going with this. It's putting myself in a position where despite what the, the media and politicians and other people's plans, I'm gonna live within my plan. I'm gonna stay attuned to my higher purpose I'm going to do the things in my life that I believe are purposeful and intentional and focused on those things. So that's where I want to begin to lead with folks. That's how we begin to counteract some of the violence by becoming more fully human, because then you become in line with love. And as you all know, some of you all may know, I look at love. It's been a synonym for God, not to say it's about being religious. But love is the energy that we all love to be experiencing, tapped into, as well as connected to. And the more you connect to the energy of love, the less you connect to the energy of hate. And hate energy is what usually leads to violence in your mind. It can easily escalate violence and put you in a, in a space where you're more prone to violence. I think about a lot of times when I'm driving and just commuting and if I haven't prepared myself mentally to deal with the what I consider to be the challenges of driving, people are driving slow, cutting you off in traffic, not driving the way you want them to go or as fast as you want them to go because you're in a hurry, then you can easily get caught in world rage where you may, and I've done this often, quite a few times myself where somebody's driving slow. It takes me uh, maybe a minute or two to get around them. And I finally get around them. And of course, I want to look in the car and see who that person is. I'm not necessarily giving that person an ugly look. I just want to see who this person is that's driving. So, you know, either unintentional, uh, slow, you know, dangerous, I would say. So I'm not giving a person a dirty look. I'm looking, my intention is just to see who this person is. Now, the, the, the person who's been driving that way, see me look at them and they look over at me, they may receive that as a ugly look and it could get escalated. So now they may feel as though because of whatever they're dealing with, whatever the reason they may be driving, in my opinion, dangerously, they may feel I'm driving dangerously because I'm trying to get around them. I'm trying to go fast. Etc. that they don't like my energy now. I could be the trigger that gets them to the point where they now want to do road rage. So now they want to chase me through traffic or butt my car or flick a finger at me or, or do something that triggers me. And so all they can escalate. And see, that to me is where if you don't have a plan for how you're going to deal with and expect that when you drive, 
even to the market or when you're driving that requires highway driving, there are going to be several instances along that journey that can trigger you if you don't have a plan, if you're not connected to love, if you haven't thought about what your purpose is in life, your higher purpose, not the purpose of just making money and taking care of yourself, but what can you do to make the world a better place around you? What can you give to society? What value can you bring to the world in the context of the energy of love and helping others, and serving others? And see, if that's in the space you're in, and then to me, that's where we become more free humans about because now you're transcending the labels that our country and our world has put on you. You descend, you're transcending just being a man or a woman. You're transcending being straight or gay. You're transcending being black, white, Asian, or whatever your ethnicity may be. You're transcending all those things and becoming just human. And human being. When you see another human being in pain, when you see another human being suffering, has the empathy, the emotional intelligence to want to do something to help that human being. And if you're in that kind of space, then you're aligned with love. And if you're aligned with love, then you're not going to be tempted to not add to be triggered by violence or little incidents that can bring violence into you. Because again, in today's world, depending on where you live, depending on where you have to go, people can be triggered for a lot of reasons. People are dealing with a lot of things. People are being evicted on a daily basis. People are unemployed. People are unemployed. People have health issues, medical issues they're dealing with. They're dealing with family members who may be sick. They're dealing with traumatic experiences. So they're, they're walking around with all that in their mind. They're processing it. They're trying their best to deal with it. And then you come along and you bring in your energy and your energy is negative, those are the trigger points that brings violence. So Reggie's back again. Let's bring Reggie back to the conversation. Reggie, you're back. Hopefully you're back to stay this time. Yeah, I don't know what's going on here, but uh, I just had to reset everything. Um, so I apologize to anybody <laughs> who's been offended by my, my absence. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I have the general gist of what we were speaking about, and I just wanted to, to amplify w one piece. Um, and this, you know, this comes from my reading of and listening to the late Congressman John Lewis, you know, and he credits uh, James Lawson, who was the, you know, was the primary um, teacher of uh, nonviolent protest back in the late 50s and early 60s, where the uh, you know the students who who formerly protested, who um, you know sat at the lunch counters in the South and who um, rode the buses in the South, you know, they were required to wear the the women wore dresses, the the men wore um, shirts and ties, and you can see you know even that the famous um, attack as they came across the Pettus Bridge, mm -hmm. you know as they were walking across. I mean you, you see them walking double. Double file, um, quietly, uh, and well dressed when they got, you know, beaten and run over by horses and uh, you know, just the horrible things that went on. And those images really began to shift. Not everybody, obviously, but many people in the country who saw television images of that type of thing. They saw television images of young children in the South, young black children being hit with fire hose water and being attacked by German shepherds held by law enforcement officers. So there was a real discipline, organization, and purpose behind that, which was very effective. Nowadays, um, and, and again, I'm going to, you know, just to say, if you, look at, if you look at all of the video of all the Black Lives Matter protests, um, the vast majority of them are tens of thousands of people in the streets who are nonviolent. And then there are, you know, the things that get the attention are the fires, the looting, um, and uh, often, but not always exacerbated by the approach that the police took to the protesters. So again, I'm not, I'm, I'm suggesting that if we're going to go into the streets, we should learn from those who did it very well. 
from a standpoint of organization, principles, and the biggest one is self-discipline. Um, it's not about screaming and yelling and pointing fingers and especially the middle finger projected towards somebody else, but it's about making the point and saying the violence has to stop. Um, and that occurred even in, in the in Vietnam War protests. Um, many of the protests were themselves violent. So it's this, you know, not the same, is it the same violence as dropping ordnance from B-52s and napalm and Agent Orange? No, it's not the same thing, but it's still violence. And so you have to be able to make that move. And that's a, you know, more than half a century later, you know, post-civil rights movement, um, I believe that culturally we are a less disciplined culture. Um, and when I speak about discipline, I mean self-discipline. I'm not speaking about, about you know, somebody telling me how to behave. Um, so it's, it's really quite challenging um, because it began with Buddha said it first, and then Gandhi used it, and then King used it. But basically, violence never ceases through violence, but only through love will it end. And then it, it got morphed into hatred never ceases through hatred. But that began with Buddha. Gandhi used it. Dr. King used it. And the evidence is pretty clear um, that it's true. Now, how hard is it to have somebody scream horrible things in your face? spit on you and beat you and not fight back. Um, so I'm not saying this as some easy solve, e easy, you know, practice. I don't know if I could do it. I would like to think I could, um, but I'm not sure. Um, I haven't been trained in that kind of nonviolence. But otherwise, it's just more fighting. Right? It's just more fighting. And it's more violence, and that will never end. You know, we we have enough history from from, from any history around the, the planet. You know, ancient history, long before you know the United States was even a gleam in anybody's eyes. We have the history of violence, and it never stopped violence. So it's it's pretty clear that Buddha, Gandhi, Christ, King, and others were on to something. Um, and, you know, in terms of presidential candidates, the only one who ever comes close to that, who, you know, gets a lot of mockery and everything. But if you listen to what she says, um, you know, Marianne Williamson, um, I, I don't believe that this country will elect her ever. Um, but she brings a real belief in love and nonviolence, which everybody else just gives, gives lip service to for the most part. Right. So, um, you know, and, she, and people have great, you know, they, both sides of the media, left and the right, rolled their eyes at her. Well, yeah. Do you want to resolve these issues or do you want to keep making you millions of dollars a year by picking the most sensational images from what occurs on the streets and, and then rolling your eyes about whose fault it is because you're getting paid well to do that? What happens if people are getting along and you have to cover people hugging each other? What happens if you have to cover um, people getting along? What happens if things really get good? What, ha you know, what do you do with all of the 24 seven media and social media and the antagonists who benefit from it? I don't know, be interesting to try. Absolutely, absolutely it would be great to try. That's why I believe that, you know, unfortunately, I would like to, I would hope that the entirety, the whole can try. But I really believe that at the end of the day, it's going to have to be folks who make a decision to try and only connect with those who are in alignment with that kind of thought process. You know, yeah. that's why I advocate create your own connection, intelligent tribe of folk who resonate with what you're saying and align with your purpose your higher purpose and your values, because that's what the world is pushing us towards. It's trying to push us in, into tribes forcefully based off our agenda, based off our race, based on our, based on our politics, based on our sexual orientation, et cetera. 
But I advocate that you need to, again, don't worry about trying to change the system. Create your own new system that's going to be based off your harmony, your values, things that's going to bring you joy. And that, to me, is the solution to a lot of these issues. Now, again, do I have data to back that up? No. But I'd rather go down that road and live my life in that path. And if I'm wrong down that path, at least I brought myself a field in time. Yeah. And, and you know, I would argue in, in support of what you just said, <laughs> what we've been doing isn't working. I mean, you know, there's plenty of data to support that right. across the board. Um, you know, the current system doesn't work. Whether you look at violence, which we're talking about today, whether you look at ambivalence about the planet, also known as climate change and other things that we've talked about. If you want to look at inequality and greed, um, you know, the current iteration of capitalism doesn't work. It works for a handful, for some people, um, but it hurts a lot of people. And so I would say, yeah, we, you know, <laughs> you want to keep doing this, I mean, because it's not, it's not working. And I think it's really important to say, and it's, you know, I typically don't try to plug the book, but but I want you know I, I think for anybody listening to this, today's topic, interrupted as it was probably by the violent people who wanted to keep us from talking about it. I don't know what was going on with that because I don't think it's happened before to this extent where you know I'm, everything went down here. No, I'm haven't. on pretty good Ethernet connection, but um, if you look back at all of these conversations. You know, these these fully human connection conversations is over a year's work of now. We don't get paid to do them. We're doing them because we believe in what we're saying. And that creates, you know, that can hold the violence conversation in a much larger perspective. And the same thing is true with the book. Um, in fact, there isn't one chapter on violence in the book. Vi violence kind of informs a lot of the chapters because it's there. But, you know, we really have to reconsider who and what we are as human beings, what we referred to earlier. Who am I really? Um, I like to ask people, I used to ask this to some of my high school students, whether they were, you know, they believed in religion and the creation story in Genesis, or they believed in science or some mix of those. And I would always say, you know, okay, raise your hand if you believe in this, raise your hand if you believe in that, raise your hand if you believe in something else. I said, is there anyone in the room that doesn't believe that all human beings have some common origin somewhere, whether it's the story in Genesis with Adam and Eve and that horrible snake and God, you know, cultivating the Garden of Eden or the Big Bang, you know, 13.8 billion years ago. Anybody believes in something other than that? And most of them fit into those two categories. I said, so can you see that we all come from the same place, no matter what you believe? course culture race gender blah 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 blah. do you see that so why don't you identify as a human being first and then see what happens so when you, you know you see somebody who looks different or sounds different oh but same species about 208 bone two eyes if they're lucky a nose 32 teeth you know give or take because they have problems with teeth sometimes but you know it's the same species right and if you, if you want to get real serious, the planet and everything else we can see in the night sky pretty much began at the same time, too, from the same energy. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, one of the great moments, and, and if people laugh at it, but some, some of us who are old enough remember Rodney King, who was beaten by the um, Los, Los Angeles police department and was it was one of the first video tapes of a, of a beating um and then when they the police were found not guilty of doing anything wrong basically you know the riots broke out i mean parts of la burned and they interviewed king and he saw this going on and he said something like why can't we all just get along that was his quote and i mean you know is it overly simplified? Maybe, but that's exactly the question. Can't we all just get along? Because look what we do to each other. 
Um, so the violence isn't going to go away magically, I don't think. Like I said, it's rooted in our society. I mean, yeah. and just think about the fact that uh, while you were experiencing your technical issues, I mentioned the fact about violence can easily be triggered. And I use the example of like when I drive places and as much as I work to be fully human, stay in the constant love energy, I can get in the car. And if I'm not mentally preparing myself that I'm gonna get cut off, there's gonna be drivers who antagonize me or get on my nerves and drive slow. Yep. If I just get in the car and don't prepare myself like that mentally, then I'm going to allow myself to get triggered by those drivers. And the minute I get a chance to get around that driver, I often look to the to the car, not to give a person an ugly look, but I just want to see who's driving that way. I'm just curious, like, who is it? You know, I just want to, you know, is it a man? Is it a woman? Is it someone old? Is it someone young? Whatever the case may be, it's more mm -hmm. out of curiosity. Yeah. But the person who, are, who may see me looking at them won't receive it that way. They receive it as though I'm giving them a ugly look. Yep. And they can be triggered. And just like that, both our days can be ruined because now they can come and do something like flick me off with a finger. And if I'm triggered because my bank account was empty or, you know, somebody hit my car, whatever the case may be, now we're in a road rage just like that. It's so quick and so easy for violence to get started because it's, in our subconscious mind, because again, of what we've been constantly force fed through the media, the movies, the TVs. That's why I said that it's not just a good idea to become fully human, as you were talking about before. To me, I think it's absolutely imperative that we have to in order to survive and get through this life and get to the end and have a well lived life. Because I'm going to be 50. Five this year, I believe, 55, 54. It's funny how you forget your age once you get to be out 40. When you're <laughs> below 40, you know exactly what age you are. But my point I'm making is there's only probably been less than 10 times in my life where I've had to be violent. Hmm. Right. And that was, we, you know, so violence still is a choice at the end of the day. You know, you can choose to be not violent, but you, you alluded to earlier, if someone comes and they, you know, are going to bring physical harm to you and your family members, then I believe everyone needs to do whatever they need to do to, to stop that threat. But despite that, I think if most people are becoming more, if your focus is to become more fully human, you love in your heart, you reduce the likelihood that you would be triggered. And that's the best we can do. Yeah, no, I agree with you. In fact, the, the car example, I mean, I, that was one of my first meditative practices beginning in my 30s because you know, I grew up driving in the greater New York City area. And it got to the point where nowadays I don't, anything happens, somebody cuts me off or I inadvertently cut somebody off from Carol's moment. That doesn't happen a lot, but it can happen. Um, if I do something wrong, I actually, uh, that's the only time I'll basically wave to the person and kind of nod and say, you know, I'm sorry, or something like that. But, but otherwise, I don't even make eye contact anymore because of, because of exactly what you said. Um, because it used to go from, you know, mutual flipping of the bird, you know, give it, you know, both drivers give each other the finger. Then I would just stare at the person. And I can, you know, I have, the, the eyes have power, right? You just know, you're like, you're like, you don't have to say anything. You're just right. telling the person what you think with your eyes. But that just incites them. So now something happens, especially if it happens behind me. And somebody's honking and screaming, they pass. I just drive. I look straight ahead. I won't make eye contact anymore because um, I'm not going to in, incite it. But it took me years to get there. So this, this is actually good. So, you know, this way our viewers won't think that we were born perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. I can see that I, I every day. Yeah. I haven't gotten there yet. I was there for a period of time. But, you know, something happened, and now I allow uh, that to bring me a little more negative energy than I did in the past. And I'm working to get back to that space because, you know, it's based on what I listen to. I listen to audio books. It's, it's self-empowering. 
if I'm in that space of learning and growing, then I'm out of And plus, if I leave on time, like if I leave before time. So those are the conditions. If I, you know, leave where I got a good window of time to get somewhere, so I'm not in a hurry, I got the right listening material, then I reduce the likelihood that I'm going to be triggered by someone's uh, driving what I consider to be foolishly or danger dangerously. Yeah. Is yeah. that Reggie? Oh. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. Oh. So, so the... Um, the car is a good place to, to practice for sure. It, no, it really is. It's, yeah. yeah. The car, you know, but even uh, just going to the store, you know, depending on where you live. Like I said, just just quickly, I know we didn't we get to the end of the show and wrap things up, but I just want to make this point that nowadays people are dealing with so much, they're dealing with the fact that they're either unemployed, underemployed, the fact that they're not appreciated by their jobs and their boss and their spouse, their spouse or traumatic experiences happening or just the media bombardment of negative information. So a person's processing that every single day and every single moment and how a person deals with that is how they're dealing with it. And you just have it come into their life at a, at a key moment and then you allow yourself to bring a negative energy. That's how violence can, can quickly get escalated and get triggered. And that's why I was saying that the only counter to it, um, well, my question for you, instead of me defining that solution, let me use it now to move into our question period. What do you suggest that people do to help navigate these violent, turbulent waters that we're currently living in and not get swept up in them? Yeah, so the suggestion will be heard differently by different people. If somebody is inherently violent and, and just thinks violence is the way to do things, what I'm going to say next might sound like idiocy. Um, but I think the vast majority of people on the, I really believe the vast majority of Americans, the vast majority of people on the planet are, get up every day and whatever their culture is, whatever their life is like, they try to do a good job and try to, to they try to love. I think the vast majority of the eight plus you know, billion people on the planet live that way. The troublemakers are a much smaller number. Um, um, and that's, you know, we speak about that, but it would be in that moment when I am triggered by something or someone and my response is to yell or to confront them or in the worst case scenario, make physical contact, which is almost, I'd have to be defending myself or a loved one for that to happen. And as I joked earlier, you know, I better be able to pick up a stick or something because <laughs> I don't have much skill set or, or, uh, you know, much girth or, or power on my 135 pounds, especially at 69 years old. But more seriously, to remember, okay, this person is struggling as well. So remember, this is another human being. And what is it that I can to ask myself, what is it that I can do that doesn't require me to defend anything to be afraid of anything and just show up and basically say something like, are you okay? Is everything okay? To ask a question. Um, but I need to center myself first. The best way I do that is I can imagine, I know what it feels like to be enraged. I know what it has felt like to be enraged in, in the past and what that has resulted in. It's never resolved whatever issue I was dealing with. Right. So, I, I have a good memory of that and I know what it feels like and I don't want to go there. So I check, I just check in with myself and I can do that really quickly now. And it's like, are you okay? Is everything all right? Um, and now is that going to resolve every conflict? Absolutely not. Will it resolve some? Absolutely. Because some people have never heard that question before. Another human being saying, is everything all right? Are you okay? Um, or if you saw something that happened, just you know, ignore that, ignore them because they're not important. Are you okay? So just to you know, offer support in that moment, um, while still making sure that you don't put yourself foolishly in a dangerous situation. I mean, and that's that's a hard thing to know nowadays because. Um, there was, as you said, there were so many people on edge 
but err on the side of being helpful and not dramatic and just, you know, are you okay? Is everything all right? Is there anything I can do to help? Um, and if you get more rage or you sense more danger, then remove yourself from the situation as quickly as you can. Absolutely. That's great advice. And I think it, the more we practice, you know, and it may sound kind of, as you say, kumbaya but the more we practice love and focus on love as your dominating thought, then the less violent you're going to be. The less like you're likely to be triggered, the more patient you'll be. And I think we need to continue this violence conversation for another episode because there's so much to unpack in one hour. And then, of course, we had some interruptions in this. Hmm. Get a chance really get a chance to get a lot of your thoughts in. But as we bring the show to a close, um, we both want to share our, who we feel as a human being that has a practice and behavior traits of being fully human, whether they're past or present. And I'll go first and say that to me, the person I'm going to choose today is going to be uh, Stevie Wonder. And I choose Stevie Wonder because, again, of the type of songs he's chose to sing that are timeless, that are about love. As a matter of fact, one of his songs that he, as we talk about violence, one of the songs he has is a song called Love that's in need of love today. So even love is in need of love today, you know, and that's where I think it's an excellent uh, way to encapsulate this show and dealing with violence is that we got to look at how we can love. See, we wonder was a person, and obviously, you know, people know he's blind, he's been blind his entire life, but he doesn't never see himself as a victim. He only wanted to share love, write about love, and have people experience the joy in producing music at the highest level. And to me, that is an example of someone being fully human and still then to this day, if you look at Stevie Wonder, you're not going to see any kind of negative imagery come out of him. Negative energy at all is just going to be love. And that, to me, is a person I want to hold up. Yeah, beautiful. Um, as, as you said his name, the first song title that came up for me was I Just Called to Say I Love You. So that was the, <laughs> the immediate one that, that came up. Um, but I want to um, honor uh, Dr. Gabor Mate, um, mm. who I believe was born in Hungary, if I'm not mistaken, but he lives now in in uh, British Columbia, I think in Vancouver, but he's an, M an MD. Um, he has at least three books out. The most recent one, which kind of is a culminating book after the previous two, is called The Myth of Normal. And he really speaks about um, the shortcomings of the mainstream medical community in terms of what they accept as normal and what they ignore in terms of what science has to offer. But his previous books were the um, When the Body Says No, um, which is ties in stress and uh, trauma with disease. And the one before that was in the realm of the hungry ghosts, which is a Buddhist metaphor, but dealing with addiction. Uh, so he's he's done some phenomenal work in the world. And he's a really grounded, kind of calm individual when he presents, when he speaks. But he also owns his own addictions. That's where that's where the fully human piece comes in. So he writes about himself and his own flaws and mistakes he made as a young father when he was trying to get his medical practice going. So he's just he kind of brings this full fullness, this full humanity to his work. And his work, I believe, is essential in the 21st century for you know every human being on the planet, um, but especially because of his work in the Western world, you know, in terms of Europe and the U.S. and Australia, and anybody that would be considered you know impacted by the the Western mindset. So, Dr. Gabor Mate um, is the person I think is I want to honor as being fully human today. It's a great show because I've recently um, became aware of him and his great writings in the last two years. And you're right. I've watched, I've read one of his books and I've watched several of his interviews online. And his teachings just helped me understand tra trauma a lot better, the root cause of it and how to deal with it and really how to 
really, again, from a growth perspective, grow yourself. So definitely great choice there. Yeah. Well, Reggie, we've gotten through today's show. So it's a little longer than we normally do. So listen, audience, if you still tuned in with us, those who hung out with us through despite despite the technical issues, we appreciate it. We're gonna pick up violence as another uh, another segment on violence because I really want to really drill delve down deeper with Reggie on this as we talk about the importance of it. And for those who really want to pursue the path of becoming more fully human, I definitely encourage you all to pick up Reggie's book, uh, read his book, Healing American Narrat Healing America's Narratives, the short title of it. And I think it's a great book. Uh, I've been blessed to have a copy of it. And of course, I've been able to be blessed to have conversations with Reggie every week to discuss elements of it. So that's really the, the bonus. How many times can you actually discuss a, a book that you've read with the author on a weekly basis? That's definitely a blessing within that context. So with everyone again for listening today, uh, we appreciate it. Every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're doing the Fully Human Connections. Engage with us on social media. And until next week, that's all. Continue to look for ways to become more fully human. Thank you for listening.